Bast. First, hi. I'm Patrick. I'm a backend developer, mostly PHP. I hate JavaScript, to say it. And this is me. I am on GitHub. This is on me on Twitter. This is me on Keybase. This is me everywhere. It's not accurate enough. I have shaved too much. But this is me. Remember it. Um, today, let's look at the four different types of caches. First, for you, I have the application cache. And if we go further from your application, you have a gateway cache, or better known as a reverse cache, reverse cache. or you have, then you have the proxy cache, annoying stuff, and at least you have your browser cache. Who has ever made an application which uses the browser cache? One. Never used the browser? Two, three, four, five, six. OK. So some of you don't have forgotten the browser cache, but most of the time it's a forgotten topic. But let's start with the application cache. The application cache is, cache is really important for you because you, it's on the server side and you have the full control of it. It's your cache, it's your application. And the stakeholders love you if you can improve the performance of your application. So do uh, caching. First of all, the application cache is key-based. You can imagine every key you want, depending on the cache, how you have a character limit. And you can decide if you cache your data partially or you cache your whole page. And you can decide if you cache your data for a single request or for a single instance, like your Docker container, like your virtual machine, or if you have a Dockerized application, you have most of the time many Docker containers, so you may cache on all nodes, on all your Docker containers, on all your virtual machines. But let's take a look at a quick example. That's from 40 days, 24 days of Blackfire. It's a method get version which simply instantiates the Symfony process component to get the Git version. This is a heavy run. If you look at the profile, always profile your application to know where is you have performance suckers. If you have 33.5% of calling this get version 10 times, we are calling git minus minus version 10 times, and it sucks 30% of our application runtime. So let's improve this. We could introduce a simple static variable, static dollar version. So we have to test if this version variable is null or not. If there is a version saved, we return this version. But if not, we call git minus minus version again and save it to the version variable and, of course, return it. That's the simplest version of utilizing a cache. But a static variable is not the best. Especially, it's only for this single request. But let's compare the profile. Now we have only 6% of application runtime to get the Git version. And it's only called once. That's a huge, huge improvement. OK, but as I said, the static variable is not a way to go. So use a lib, Luke. Please install Doctrine Cache or uh, any of the new PSR cache implementations. I like Docker and Cache more because the new PSR Cache implementations have a real cache item interface introduced. That's not nice. I simply want to get my data directly from the cache and not with a cache item in between. So install the lib via Composer. And now imagine a unique cache key. It should be unique. Otherwise, you override your cache. In this example, it's a SHA-1 code of class, method, and version. OK, then, as seen before, look in the cache if there's an entry. If it's, so, if it's true, get the, get the cache data. Otherwise, compute your version or whatever, save it to the cache, and return, of course. So with Doctrine Cache, you have different implementations to use. For a single request, or especially for testing, you should use the array cache. In this example is Silex, I initialize my cache service with a new array cache. OK, it's for testing. I don't, can't imagine a use case where I want an array cache in a production environment. So use it for testing, of course. OK, per instance, you could use the APC cache. But it's only in your PHP FBM instance on this specific server. 
Maybe you want to use Xcash? Personally, I have never seen anyone using Xcash, but it's there. Better, cache on all nodes. Whether you want to use memcached, and of course it needs a connection, construct it on your own, it doesn't matter, or you want to use Redis, it's a philosophy. But if you have a cluster running, cache between all nodes. There's only one exception where you want to cache for a node, for a single node. This is, for example, the git minus minus version. It doesn't matter if you have an Ansible, Puppet, and so on. You have different versions maybe on all your servers. So if you are depending on a value from your machine, cache it only for this machine. Otherwise, all other values should be cached around all your nodes, around all your cluster. Um, are anyone using Docrin ORM? Yeah, that's nice. That's what I want to hear. In a production environment, you should configure a Docrin to use a query cache, to use the result cache, and to reuse the metadata cache. You don't want to have Docrin ORM running without a cache on production. In this case, it's APC, but you should use memcache or Redis for a cluster. Um, with Symfony, it's even easy. Activate it in the config for your entity managers. The same, metadata result and query cache. So the only exception which is not automatically activated in Doctrine is the result cache. So if you create a query, example, select all users from your database, you can activate the result cache on your query builder on your own. Then you set the result cache lifetime, for example, one hour. The users list can be cached one hour. And please set the result cache ID. Otherwise, the cache ID is generated automatically, and you have a problem to get rid of the cache entry. If you're caching, you always need a strategy to do invalidation of the cache, to delete the cache entry. So if you have a backend where you change something of the user, you have to delete this cache entry. So you should use a good result key. And yeah, you can use it all in one line too. So specific, you have to know what you want to cache. There are heavy computations, um, like the git minus minus version call seen before, or Everything you call a binary on your server and so on is a heavy computation. Menu structures. Imagine a CMS with about 500 sites organized in many subsites. And we had an application where we are generating the menu, getting all sites, then for every site getting the subsites and getting subsites and subsites and subsites. This resulted in like 300 queries. That's not effective, that's slow. So simply, we have cached the resulting object tree, the array tree of all sites. And then we had a bad internship, to say, which has rendered this menu structure into three different HTML output. One output for desktop, and we had one output for the tablet, and we had one output for mobile. And that's not fast. It's simply, we have cached those rendered partials so the first request was sadly slow, but all other requests were really fast. Then, oops, yeah, <laughs> okay. Another thing to cache could be SQL queries. Use the result cache on Docrin or simply use the cache implementation to cache the result of a plain SQL query, like fat joins. If you're doing a join about over five tables, this will never be fast. It doesn't matter how many indexes you have, a China above five table is not fast. You are always creating a temp table and this is slow. So cache the result of those fat joins. Yeah, slow queries is the same. Maybe you're fetching 100,000 records, this will not be so fast. Cache it too if it's cacheable and often called queries. I have seen applications which have a database table of all countries available. They are queried in every request, but whoever changes the name of a country expects there's a war and it's conquered by Russia. <laughs> so cache the result of a get all countries in your cache. Then there are special network requests. 
What is a special like network regress to cache? Like an API which data changes hardly, like a country API. It's the same, like a country table. Cache the result. Um, a good example is a newsletter system like MailChimp or Avalanche. They may have an may have an ID to country mapping, and you need the IDs. You don't need the IDs on every regress to fetch from the API. Cache it. Please cache it. Your users will love you if you are fast. Or a lower lifetime to data APIs. For example, sorry, I got lost. Yeah. A data API which changes not so fast, you could cache it for 30 seconds or 60 seconds if you have a high traffic application. And what you should really cache is Google geocoding requests. They don't like it if you do live geocoding on every request on every view of your map. Cache those reverse geocoding from an address to coordinates or coordinates to an address. Cache this. Google doesn't like you if you do geocoding on every web request. And then there is past config like YAML, XML, or annotations. You don't want to pass it on every request. It's the same. Compile those stuff to PHP. Even your templates like Twig does, or like the Symfony DI container does. It constructs a big PHP file with all instantiation of your services, and that's nice and fast. The Symfony routing is also fast. They even removed the Apache hate the access dumper because they say the Symfony routing in PHP is even faster than Apache rewrite rules. And Symfony translations from YAML, from XLIF files, is also cached to be plain PHP files with an array of all translations. For example, let's take a look at this routing. We have a home route slash home. We call it home page. Okay. And we have a route slash hello slash some name. And this is the cached routing matcher. At first, we can look if the route begins with slash h. If it's not, we skip a whole if block. If you have many routes with starting with h, we are skipping, for example, 500 routes, and this is fast. Then we can look, start, is the route slash home directly? If it's so, we return all the controller and route attributes. If not, we go further, check if the route begins with slash hello, if it's so, we can do a break match to extract the name and so on. And this is really fast. So if you have some configs, cache them. Have you any questions to PHP compiling? It's not easy to do this. If the Symfony router is a real complex class, for example, if you have ever time to analyze this, but it's it brings you real performance. So let's recap this. You should really cache all your heavy stuff and at least have an invalidation strategy. As said, if you do caching, you have to delete it. I mean, if your lifetime of the cache is 30 seconds, it doesn't matter. But if you cache some data for one hour or for one day and you have to edit it and you have it full control in your application, not like in the browser cache, then you can delete it. The editor of your CMS edits stuff, like the page in a menu structure, and the menu structure is deleted from the cache, and on the next request it's generated again. And use a library. Please use a library. If you don't use a library to do caching, Chuck Norris will come to your house and roundhouse kick your door and destroy all your data. <laughs> okay, and compile some configs to PHP. Really, you don't like to pass your damn YAML config every request. And profile your application. Please profile. Nowadays, with Blackfire or Tideways, you have no excuse to not profile your application and look where you have performance problems. So now everyone knows how you can improve the performance with caching in your application. Looks not so lucky, but I hope so. <laughs> um, on the other side, we have application caches. We have our gateway cache, a proxy cache, and then we have the browser cache. And browser caching can be fun, but it's not really fun. The pro of browser caching is you have less regrets and less traffic. 
if you're in a cloud and you have a high performing website in means of user traffic, you pay terabytes of traffic. If you can improve this with browser caching, you can save thousands of dollars or slot or ten thousand of slotty. <laughs> and the downside, it's client side. It's only in the browser, of course, and you have no control of it. Which means you can't say to the hey browser, please delete this entry. I want to send you a new one. You can't do this. There's one exception with changing the URL in the linked HTML file, like cache busting, we do every time with JavaScript and CSS sources, but basically the cache in the browser is URL based. One URL is one cache entry. Of course, as I said, with cache busting, you change the URL, you get a new cache entry. You have no invalidation. As I said, you can't delete some stuff from the browser's cache. And it's a simple lifetime. You can define, say to the browser, hey, cache my site for one hour. Or you can say to the browser, if you have to decide, please ask me if you can use this in the cache or not. Or you can use both. You can say to the browser to cache it for one hour, and then if the one hour is, if the one hour is over, the browser asks you if it's fresh or not. So let's uh, take a look at expiration. That's the simple con cache control header you can send with a max age of half an hour and a shared max age of 10 minutes. And not, this is not a typo, it's written as it is. Max age has the minus between max and age, and sh the shared max age has the minus between the S and max age. Standards, real cool standards. So the best is to use a library, or if you're using Symfony, you have it already. At least use the Symfony HTTP Foundation or any of the new PSR7 middle uh, HTTP message implementations. In this case, we simply render whatever we render. We set the response to public. We set the max age of half an hour, and we set the ma shared max age for proxies. The shared max age is used for proxies and gateway caches, not for the browser, to 10 minutes. And that's it. So we say to the browser, cache this page half an hour and then come back to me. But you could do the same with validation, which is not caching in the browser, but instructing the browser to ask you, is it fresh, is it fresh, is it fresh on every request. E-tag is something like an entity tag. It can be anything. A SHA-1 hash of your entity, a timestamp, a customized string, whatever, it doesn't matter. You simply send cache control, no cache, and an e-tag. And if the user visits the site again, the browser asks you with if none match, and the same e-tag you have sent before. And if it's really fresh, so you don't have changed the site, you can say 304 not modified. And the browser reuses the page he has in its cache. This is... <laughs> Another Symfony example, render your, you, in this case you need to get your entity or whatever to compute your e-tag. You don't need to render the page, but you need the entity to compare if it's fresh or not. Then you create a new response, set it to public, as you, you should, and here you set the e-tag. Please use a compute e-tag or a similar function on your entities or whatever you're using. Don't do the computation, computation directly in the controller. And after you have set the e-tag to the response, you can ask the response to compare with the request, with the if none match header, if it's modified or not, and simply return the response. In this case, Symfony already sets the correct status code. And if it's, not, if it's modified, it's false, and so you simply render the stuff, the rest of the page, and output it. OK. You if you don't have some data to compute the e-tag, or it's too heavy to compute the e-tag, because your model or your entity has, is so complex, you may use the last modified header. You simply send the last modified header with a perfect standardized date time. That's the expected format. You, no ISO date. It's really weird. And if the user visits the site again, it's asking if modified since header, that if 
instead of a if none match. So if it's match, it returns three of one not modified. The same code with the only difference you said the last modified with a for example get updated at if your data your entities have a good timestamp able behavior. Test it, return it, and render the stuff if it's modified. You could do both. I can imagine a scenario where I can you where I want to use both the e tag and the last modified, but you can do it. So you should know it, you can do it. In this case, the browser asks you with an in if none match and a if last modified. And only if both are correct, if both match, you can say it's not modified. Otherwise, if the e tag differs or the last modified differs, you should return the content. Same example, get your data, set e tag and set the last modified. Test it and return. And you can combine all three together. You can send a max age and do validation. In this case, it can get a bit complicated, but only if the max age is reached in the browser. So the entry is stale, the half a hour is forby now is over in our example, sorry. <laughs> um, the browser asks our server with the same if none match, if last modified headers, if he can reuse the cache or not. And in this case, if you are returning the not modified, you should return also the cache control header with max age again. So the browser caches your page a half an hour again. If you forget the cache control header with max age, you don't have validation, only validation again. No caching lifetime. So that's really important to don't important to don't forget the cache control max age header if you do lifetime and validation together. And then there's a special header, the verify header. It looks simply like verify accept. So you are instructing the browser to get great separate cache entries depending on the content of the request header accept in this case. For an API example, you could the browser could say accept application JSON, or he could say you want application XML. And if you return very accept, the browser will create separate entries depending on what, what content type it get requested. Sorry. Um, it's the same with a Symfony HTTP foundation. Simply set very on the response or multiple varies. Where is this useful? For example, you for content negotiation, you want cache pages where you have content negotiation like the accept header, which negotiates you the content type of the page. Or you're using accept language to get to return different translated pages on the same URI. On the view as a yo see you view as for Google, etc., you shouldn't return different translations on the same URI. So these are not really headers to vary on. The only header you can vary on on a cache is really for different encodings, the accept encoding header. Accept encoding is for compressing like gzip or deflate. Browsers may compress your, may your page wanted to compress or not. And if you don't send the correct vary header, you can have gibberish in your browsers and your users hate you if they say gibberish. And special things to take care of while you do browser caching. It's the public private thingy. By default, the cache control header says it's public, even if you don't write public in the control header. Public means it's cacheable by all proxy caches and gateway caches in between it, the connection to your server and the browser. Don't cache user specific stuff like credit card data, etc., in a proxy cache. That's not cool. So you say that the browser is private. Private means no proxy and no gateway cache in between is allowed to cache it. Only the browser is allowed to cache it. And the lifetime. You should really get a plan which page should get which lifetime. It can be complicated, but we will see in a use case later. And template changes are not reflected in your e-tag or last modified calculations. 
So you, if, you have, if you have a template bug, like a wrong table or a wrong div set, and you change it, fix it, deploy it, the user will re not recognize it until the lifetime of his cache entry is over, or if you're only using validation. But as I said, it's not reflect on the e-tag unless modified. So if the user validates your site, the browser, with if none match or if, no, if not modified since, then it's not reflected and the user has the old page, the broken page for it, if you are unlucky. And then that's the annoying one, the customer. Customers are always a problem, like, why is the site not changed? We have cached it. It's for performance reason. Or, no way, that's too long. In the project, we have a simple block with a new post per month, one post per month. And it's too long for the customer. Yeah, fuck it. And then, I need the change immediately. All the stuff they wanted to change want to see the immediately. Okay, press F5 and you see the change. Your users not, but that doesn't matter. So you may have problems with the customer if you do too long browser caching. Uh, some use cases for you. I said it's a blog news page, but only if you don't have a commenting system on it. If you are doing comments in your application, it's not good to cache. Maybe use this cast, which is lazy loaded via Ajax or JavaScript, then you can cache the block or news page again. And use, please use an incrementing lifetime. If you are publishing a new post and it gets rushed by 10,000 of users and you have a technical error, then you can't fix it for the users if you cache it for one day. So if you're publishing a new post, cache it for one minute for the first few days, then after three days, cache it, f for example, for 10 minutes, and so on. After the lifetime of your blog post, increase the cache lifetime. So you don't have a problem fixing typos or technical errors. Because it's not nice if you write in the comments, now I have fixed it, please look again, and the user can't see your fix because he has, ca it's a, he has it cached in its browser cache. And as I said, end it with a long lifetime. Maybe after a month you can set a lifetime of one or two days on the blog post. And use validation. I said if you have a lifetime of one minute at the beginning of the blog post, you don't want to have the traffic from the user again. You, won't, you want to have only the if none match request from the user and return your 304 not modified. So you don't have traffic of the content. Another example would be homepage, and the homepage is really complicated to cache. It has mixed static contents, and maybe you should only cache some lazy loading stuff for one or four hours or 10 minutes. It depends on the really on the content which is on the homepage. And if possible, use validation. This is a customer example. It's a dashboard composed of four different types of entities. Um, events, the page, the main menu pages, blog posts. I even can't use e -tech calculation on this because it's so complicated. So let's look at the first row. If you can see it, we have a load time of 250 millise milliseconds. It's not slow, but it's too slow for a page where you still have 50 regrets. And the 250 milliseconds is already improved because we have an application cache, which caches the whole output. So if it's not cached in the application side too, we have about two seconds. Okay, so if you send this cache control header with a max age of four hours, and we're doing a shared max age of one hour for the proxy caches, it's improved only three milliseconds to load from the browser cache. And if you do this on a site where I have, for example, 20 HX requests, which are all contents. You can improve the subsequent loading times amazingly, and your users love you again. And yeah, if the user presses F5, the browser sends a cache control max age with zero, which doesn't matter for your application. It's only an instruction for proxy and gateway caches to refresh the content from the server side. So if I have a corporate proxy in between, a F5 instructs your proxy cache 
to get the page from the server again. Okay, maybe you have a map search on your pages, contact or retailer searches. You maybe can cache these two. Like, it depends on your object. If you have a retailer search to search for retailers, they will not change so often, so you could cache them. And of course, use validation. Always use validation. Uh, article search or other filters like product searches, okay, products and articles are the same. Whatever you can filter and search, please no caching. There are too much combination which would be cacheable and you don't have an improvement because the user changes filters and filters, so it doesn't matter. Maybe you can validation on the results. And to prevent caching, sometimes you need to prevent caching, like in a checkout process, you could send no cache. But we have seen no cache already on e-tag validation and last modified validation. If you don't send an e-tag, the browser should really not cache it, but not sure. If you have private data, maybe you add a no store attribute, which should instruct the browser really to don't store this page. There's only one works. If you're going through a checkout and the user presses back, the browser still gets the page from your cache, from the memory while you, when you press the back button. So please add must revalidate, which really instructs the browser to get the page again from the server even you, when you press the back button. And yeah, at a post check and a pre check too, I d really don't know what they are doing, but I have seen them so often. If a site should not be cached, simply add them. Okay, let's recap this. Uh, you should be sensible to the user. Get a good lifetime for depending on your objects which means have a caching plan policy. At the beginning of the project, work out a plan, a policy, which objects could be cached with this lifetime and so on. And always have an e-tag on your responses. Even if you don't want to have the pages cached, have an e-tag because you can test on your server side if it's modified or not and can save the traffic of the response. And let's look at a cache plan policy, a cache decision structure. First, you can decide, is the response reusable or not? If it's not, please do a no store, like checkout process, my, history, my orders history, and so on. If it's reusable, you have to decide, um, should the browser revalidate it each time or not? If it should be revalidated, set a no cache, together with e-tag or last modified. If the browser should not revalidate it each time, Simply add a max age, and first you have to decide it should be public or not private. And as I said, care, please care about your user privacy, and user data which should be cached should always be private. And then you set the ma max age, and even if you have a max age, still set the e tag header to have validations after the max age is over and the entry is stale in your browser. Then, a sneak peek to proxy caches. The proxy caches are on the internal network or more on the client side. It depends if it's a corporate proxy in a company or it's, in the I it's at the ISP, at your internet provider. They behave like browser proxy, browser caches, but they are shared. Like in a corporate, co in a company, they are shared between all employees. At the internet provider, they the cache is shared between all customers of the internet provider. They are still URL based, but they are really annoying because there are some KFETs. As seen, as said before, the user privacy. Care about if it, your response should be public or private. I cannot say it often enough. And proxy caches don't behave like often like the standard says. Maybe there's a company proxy which want to cache everything, even if, if it should not. Shit happens, but then the customer says, you have fucked up, but not their admins. And maybe there are mangled headers from proxy caches and even antivirus software installed on the user's computer, like accept encode xing or 
except encoding or all x or all minus or all tiled. This can encounter on like 5% to 1% down on of all your users. It's not nice. So you can't compress your response and your traffic increases again. To tackle this, simply copy the snippet in your Apache config and this regex matches all these mangled headers and if it's find one, it sets a regressed header to have a clean accept encoding. Simply copy it, it doesn't matter if, have you, if you have a user base which has these problems with mangled headers or not. And then the gateway caches, or better known as reverse proxy. This is again on your side. It's not directly in your application, but you have still full control over it. You can do a URL-based caching strategy together with a custom hash calculation. This custom hash can depend on any regress or response header, or even on cookies, which should be filtered. And the pro of a reverse proxy on your side is you can do edge side includes, which means, for example, if you have a product, product detail page, the product detail page should be cached for one day or a whole week, but not the price on it. So you simply set a tag where the price is, uh, ESI include, to a backend route for article price, and then if the user hits this, hits this product detail page, the reverse proxy cache can uh, sorry, get lost again. This reverse proxy can get the page from the cache and then it sees the ESI include and fetches the price live from the backend. And now the user always gets the actual price and not a cached one. Because don't have a cached price at the user. He wants to buy it, puts it in the basket and then have a different price. He's angry, he's annoyed and it could be a legal problem too. Then uh, the bad part about using, about using reverse proxy is you have a complex invalidation. You need to uh, use ban requests, flush requests, and there are only two hard things in computer science. Cache invalidation and of course naming things. It's a nice citation by Phil Carlton. If you want to use a reverse proxy cache, Either use Varnish, which is the most advanced one, a bit complicated configurer. For simple sites, you could use Nginx if you're not using Apache. Uh, or at least you should use the Symfony HTTP cache component, which behaves like Varnish but uses a file based caching. Don't go on production without a Symfony HTTP cache if you have a Symfony application. The usage for this reverse proxy cache is the same like a browser cache with HTTP headers, but you, as said, you have extra regress for banning and flushing cache entries. You can't simply do this cache remove. You have to do a regress to the reverse proxy server. And for the sake of it, use the lib again. Use the false HTTP cache library. Although the vendor name says Friends of Symfony, it's a standalone library and it has an extra Symfony bundle. So if you ever are in need of a reverse proxy, use a lib. Don't do the curl request or gussel request on your own. And there are also common mistakes while using a reverse proxy. You didn't clean up cookies. For example, Varnish in the default config, if, you, if the browser sends a cookie, it wouldn't be cached. So you have to clean up cookies and maybe have one or two cookies which are used in the hash calculation and forwarded to the backend. And then the site is, ca is cached again. And please don't cache user-specific content. Don't cache the credit card data of a user in your reverse proxy. Otherwise, every user will see this credit card data. And run cache headers. It's the same as before, if you send public to a private request, it's a wrong cache header. And unsafe request. An unsafe request is all those requests which are modifying data, post, put, etc. For example, Vanish again, in the default config, it won't cache, cache any post request. If you have an error in your config, you may cache post requests, and that's bad. So. 
to be friendly to our camera guys, that's the end. And the time for your questions. No questions? <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation. I have a question about uh, setting um, the cache for um, Symfony response. Uh, you, you show us some methods like set, uh, max, uh, lifetime, and etc. So I have a question, how do you handle when you want to um, turn off the cache in the Symfony application for developers? So it's cache is Cool for production, but, but how do you turn, in, turn it off for developers? If I understand you correctly, you mean the Symfony HTTP cache component? Yeah, yeah, yeah. HT okay, HTTP the last foundation for response. No, the HTTP foundation is different from the HTTP cache component. The HTTP foundation, the response object, is by default not cached. So you always have to do set max age or anything else to have the response cache, but yeah, you yeah, we are right. But the Symfony uh, response sends a no cache, no store, and so on header by default. Okay, so mm, when we set up some the, these uh, those values like uh, max lifetime, uh, so how do you do when you want to turn it off for uh, development environment? Okay, uh, you can use a response event handler. Okay, in so in a full stack yeah, yeah, Symfony but application, uh, but this means that like uh, you have uh, set up some map, yeah. So when there's a response for this uh, URL, then set up this value for cache, yeah, something like that. In this even under for the response, yeah. In the response handler, you would simply unset all cache headers on the response. Okay. On okay. development. Okay, thank you. Another one? Okay. Thank you so far. <laughs>